Shake and bake, Cal. Woo! Shake and bake! Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and what kind of parent do you want to be? The kind who's too busy for your kids because you're working? Or who's too busy for your kids because surf's up, dude? Today, to help you become the latter, we welcome Doug Nordman and his daughter, Carol Pittner. For our TikTok Minute, we've got a new hobby suggestion you're going to love. In our headlines, this year's cost of living adjustment is in for Social Security. There's a reason to throw a party. And we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Biff, who wants to know about what to do with his Vanguard accounts in the red. And then I'll share some sneaky trivia. And now, two guys who will always prioritize you as their little babies stacking Benjamins, Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. Hey there, stackers, and a happy Monday to you. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And welcome back. You found us. You're here at the Stacky Benjamin Show. Pull up a chair, relax, because it's time for a little money geekery for the next hour. It is party day, OG, because the new Social Security numbers are out. We're not the, we can't be the only ones that get excited about this. I, I, just, I just heard party, so... He comes in. He can party for whatever reason. He comes in with a tidal wave of joy, Doug. Just a tidal wave of wow. joy. You're just, <laughs> Joe is at a nine and a half. He's, arms are flailing in the air as Joe's talking. And OG's, OG's got one eye open. He's like, yeah, hi. All right. Plus, one of the most often asked questions we get is, how do I teach my kids about financial independence a guy who got it early, financial independence, that is. And he also, a Navy veteran, uh, Doug Nordman here with his adult daughter, Carol Pittner, who now has a daughter of her own, talking about raising financially independent children. Doug was the dad, by the way, Doug. Uh, <laughs> That's not confusing. <laughs> Doug was the dad, by the way, Doug, and you're open. You talked about going surfing. Doug was the dad who was always on his way surfing while the school bus went by. Every other dad on their way to work, Doug's on his way out to the beach, living in Hawaii. It's a tough life for Doug. It is a tough life for Doug. Are we finally going to talk about that? Are we finally going to talk I, about how difficult it is for me? I mean, I mean for Doug Nordman. <laughs> yes. Oh my God, this episode is going to be so confusing. Uh, the other Doug. It's the other Doug. Almost like Park how is the other. is going to tell the difference between cool Doug and cooler Doug? We got a great show today. I can't wait to get into it. But first, time for the Social Security Fiesta. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes to us from just about anywhere. So we chose our friend Mary Beth Franklin's piece in Investment News. Oh, gee, Social Security announces their COLA, the cost of living increase for 2023. And you want to know the serving size of this cola? You ready? 8.7% cost of living increase for Social Security. Now, you've got retired people everywhere saying hallelujah, fantastic. But I can think of maybe four or five reasons why this isn't necessarily a great thing. Well, I mean, <laughs> the biggest one has to be it's retroactive. So... It's not a future forecast. It's it's basically like, oh yeah, sorry that you, you are ten cents on every dollar in the hole for the last year. Here's a uh, here's a little little bump. Um, I can think of another one too, another reason uh, right off the bat. But uh, at least they're adjusted for cost of living. This is the big difference between Social Security and pensions. And one of the major issues we don't see them as as much anymore because last. I don't know, 10 years or so, they've really kind of fallen out of favor for a lot of reasons. But um, this is a conversation that you must think about or a, a planning item that you must think about if you are counting on having a pension in retirement, which is if it's not going to increase with inflation, you're eventually going to run out of purchasing power. And it doesn't seem like it, especially you know, if you back yourself up 10 years ago when Inflation was hardly noticeable, but even at 2% inflation or 2.5% inflation, prices double every 22, 25-ish years. 
So if your income stream isn't rising with the rising costs that you're facing throughout retirement, you're going to be in a deficit at some point. And either you have enough cash left over to fund that that gap or or you're going to be in trouble. So this is one of the things that's uh, it's actually quite helpful for retirees. You know, over the past 10 years, benefits have averaged a meager annual increase of 1.8%. Remember back in 2016, by the way, OG, us reporting, I do remember this, us reporting that there was no cost of living increase. So Zero. Yeah, there was one one time for zero. What yeah. a what an absolute change. So does this change the forecast of when there will be no more money left in the bag? If If they're kicking out a huge increase... In the cola, and by the way, it should be called E. coli, not cola. The E. coli, it should totally be the E. coli because you said it's a cost of living increase. So first of all, cola as an acronym doesn't fit those words, and it's an economic cost of living increase. So E. coli, duh. But what my question was, my more important question, both are valid, is. If they're increasing the amount of money they're putting out by 8.7%, doesn't that mean it's going to run out of money sooner? I haven't seen anything on that yet. All that I keep seeing is how that projection is all over the map, depending on who you ask. I mean, that that projection is all over the map. But that is a good point, OG. I don't know any financial planners who think about Social Security running out. I think it's important to stress test uh, reduced benefits as part of your plan just to see what happens. I don't know that going to zero is a likely outcome because since it's a government program and the government has the ability to tax whomever they want at whatever rate they want, it seems like it won't ever run out. But the problem, again, is that it's super politically charged. You know, It yeah. is the third rail of politics. Any, any sort of person who has even the most benign approach toward uh, solving this problem that person's opponent will jump. Up. Oh, you know, Doug wants to kill Social Security. It's like, no, I'd want to fix it. <laughs> Doug wants to kill it. Don't vote for Doug. He's pushing Graham off the wheelchair, off the you know wheelchair, off the mountain. Let's go in the other direction, gentlemen. The uh, author and speaker Zeke Ziegler reportedly once quipped, "If you want to earn more, learn more." That's from a piece in USA Today about getting more from Social Security, written by Selena Marangian. Selena lists 10 ways to get more money and benefits. Number one, check your social security work record for errors. Oh, gee, when you've had clients check their social security record, you notice that they have found errors. Never heard of one ever. I I can't think of one either. (laughs) Second. (laughs) But apparently it happens. But that's step one. Yeah. Yeah. Second, you want more, want more money, work longer, work at least 35 years and you're going to get a lot more money according to Selena. Number three, beef up your earnings record. Number four, so make more money when you work. These are brilliant. (laughs) Make sure they've recorded it correctly and go make more money and do it for a longer (laughs) period of time. Can't wait to hear what four through 10 are. That's the secret sauce. Wait till after 70 (laughs) to start collecting your benefits. So you can't wait till after 70. 70 is the last day. Wait until 70. Thank you. Uh, Start collecting benefits as early as age 62 is the is the fifth one. That's have your cake and eat it too. Okay, what? so wait, are we supposed to wait until 70 or collect it as early as possible? Let's take a look. Uh, on that age 70 point, she writes, procrastination is usually a good thing, but if you can put off starting to collect your social security benefits, you can make them bigger. We each have a full retirement age at which we're entitled to receive the full benefit that we've earned based on our work record. For most of us, that's 66 or 67. For each year past that age, that you delay starting to collect your benefits increase by about 8%. But in the next 8%, it's 8% plus whatever the cost of cost of living is. So if you're in that, if you're in that gap right now, if you're 68, 69, the last couple of years, you get your 8% delayed retirement credits plus the inflation. So you're cleaning up on her next uh, contrarian piece, which is about starting to collecting as early as age 62. She writes, Your checks will be much smaller if you start collecting early and you can start collecting regular retirement benefits as early as age 62. Might seem dumb to start early and get smaller checks, but remember that you might simply need the income early, perhaps due to an unexpected job loss. While the checks will be smaller, there'll be many more of them than waiting till 70. 
the system is designed so that for those who live average length lives, they'll get about the same total benefits no matter when they start collecting. If you think you stand a decent chance of living a shorter than average life, I'm betting on less uh, due to poor health or family <laughs> history, it can make good sense to start collecting early. I mean, I make a joke, but but very seriously, if you've got a you know not very long lifespan uh, history, might be a good idea, OG, to forget about that age 70 thing and start getting the Well, money. maybe. It just depends on your family stuff, right? Because then you're locking your spouse into the benefit that you pick because your your, your spouse... You know, if you're married, you get the greater of the two, your, yours or your spouse's. So um, a lifetime of 60 cents on the dollar or delaying it and, and getting a greater benefit. Usually the break even happens somewhere in the late 70s, like 79, 80, somewhere in there. Number six on this list, take advantage of spousal benefits. Speaking of spouse, number seven is a good one. Consider delaying your divorce. That yes. That's going <laughs> to... Cause it's all about more money. I can't stand looking at you. However, let's, let's keep it together for the government. And uh, number eight, don't earn too much while collecting benefits. Remember that your income uh, can affect how much social security you get. Number nine. That's before your full retirement age. Once you get to your full retirement age, you can make as much money as you want. And number nine, see if you qualify for survivor or disability benefits. And then number 10, be strategic, especially with your spouse. I got to say, OG, you're kind of impressing me with your knowledge about this specific area. And it's been a long time since I <laughs> since had impressed a you. fanboy OG moment. So you, I you think you like might work we, in this area, area. Do you work damn. in this area, OG? No, I think the important thing with, uh, with Social Security is it's super unique depending on what your certain circumstances are. Married, divorced, remarried high income earner, low income earner, health situation, other assets in the bank. Some people say, well, what's the difference between taking money out of my investment account today? I'm 66. You want me to wait till I'm 70. If I don't take Social Security, I need that $20,000 a year that I normally would have gotten from Social Security. So that's got to come out of my investment account. Which one's better, taking out of the out of the government's investment account for me or my own investment account for myself. So everybody's situation is going to be unique. I think that as you get closer to it, it's probably not a big thing to, to think too much about when you're in your 30s and 40s and early 50s, except for maybe those first few. Like, let's make sure the earnings history is correct every year and you, you get your social security statement. Just make sure it's right and, uh, and start doing some modeling of trying on different social security swimsuits, as it were. Social security swimsuits. <laughs> Something everybody loves to do. You've equated that. The annual social with, security issue. <laughs> with just about everybody's most depressing moment. The second most will be trying on social security. You're like, ah, it's only 2100 bucks. I ain't going to cover anything. Damn it. No, seriously, I'm, I'm reading my social security spreadsheet for the articles. Really? No, I am. Hey, uh, oh. 1994, 3,200. <laughs> oh, oh, what a Those year. Those are the good years. Mm. Those are the good years. Time for our TikTok Minute, the time when we shine a light on a TikTok creator. Uh, we've got a very special one today, gentlemen. You remember the old days of uh, Casey Kasem's Top 40? Or uh, yes. now we have Ryan Seacrest, Top 40. Seacrest, well, out! This song going all the way to the top of uh, financial hits. I'll tell you the name when we finish, but I bet you can guess it. I do I have to clean this Airbnb? I already paid you a cleaning fee. I'm beginning to think you don't use that money for cleaning at all. And that's not very chill of you. I don't want to sweep the floors. I don't want to sweep the floors. I don't want to take out the trash. trash. And I certainly don't want to unclog the toilet. But I actually am really sorry about that. I think I may have a gastrointestinal issue. <laughs> That's well done. <laughs> that is going around a lot, isn't it? The uh, the Airbnb is uh, people are being shysters. Yeah, the air, air. There's a big Airbnb backlash right now. We did a we did something on Twitter recently, and 
asking people about Airbnb or hotels. And I was surprised, OG, frankly, by the number of people who go, no, no Airbnb for me. No. Why? Well, now I got people that professionally do this. They know how to professionally clean the room. They also have a cafe and a bar down in the lobby if I just want to grab a quick drink or something to eat. Or I can stay in your messed up house and have to do all this extra work and, to this guy's point, pay the cleaning fee. Yeah, I, I'm the same way. I, I, I feel that the only thing that would sway me to go into an Airbnb is location. Because sometimes you want to go in a spot that just doesn't have big chain hotels or, frankly, any hotels that you can count on. But if, if, if that's an option, that's the way I'm going is a hotel. We've done uh, like whole house week vacations. That's that's the reason to Airbnb. I've never I done Airbnb. Right we always do. Always a v, always verbo. No, I refuse. VRBO. You won't say what they want you to say? Correct. You can't just have a company name for a long time and then all of a sudden change it to a different pronunciation without the vowels in the right place and expect me to acquiesce to your lack of grammar knowledge. <laughs> it's the website was vacation rental by He's owner about that this. was the website and I, i'm okay with abbreviating it if you like that's too many letters to type into the url box we did that for both of our kids graduation from from college og we had big big uh family get-togethers rented a really big house had uh, everybody under one roof it was super cool just a great great way to celebrate both of their both their graduations. And also to your point uh, about location, when we have taken trips to Europe, we've done uh, Airbnb right in the middle of town, which is also pretty special to wake up and, you know, you're right in the middle of Nice looking out over on this big square. Just beautiful. Guarantee Ritz Carlton has that. (laughs) You're saying you're okay with having to unclog the toilet. I, I am not. I am not, but I will tell you this. I do a lot of work when I do to use an Airbnb. I do a lot of homework ahead of time. When I do a, uh, when I do a hotel, I generally just pull up my Marriott app, press the button <laughs> and, and I trust that this thing's ready to go. Like there's a lot more that has to go into the Airbnb, uh, for me. Good stuff there. Thank you so much, uh, for sending that in Nancy. That was pretty hilarious when she sent that to me, uh, via Twitter, Send me your TikTok minutes, Joe at stackybedjamins.com or hit me up on social media with them. And we'll be happy to put them in the queue of uh, maybe the next greatest, greatest hits. Coming up next, Doug Nordman and Carol Pittner are a dynamic father-daughter duo. Both have served in our armed forces in the Navy. Uh, Doug on a submarine and Carol also in the Navy, no longer active duty, but her husband still is. They have both done just incredible jobs writing this book together about having about raising a financially savvy family. And you know what, even if you're not bringing up any children, I think there's so many lessons in the way these people handle money and they make decisions. I can't wait to talk to them and I can't wait for you guys to hear it. So before they come down the stairs, Doug, I think you've got some trivia to get us there. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And man, I can't wait for you to hear our guest, Doug Nordman. He sounds a little bit like my dad. And I think back to the day my pop said he knew the key to our relationship was quality time. Packing daddy's sugar packets, reloading his metal super soaker. I mean, we always played who's the lookout and he let me win. Until that time I fell asleep. But, but he let me play again once he got out. Though by that time, of course, I was old enough to be charged as an adult. Oh, those were the days. You just don't get that quality family time anymore. Hey, speaking of disappearing acts, today in history is the last day Houdini did a trick, way back in 1926. So, my question is, Houdini first started stacking Benjamins by being known as the person who could get out of which restraining device? (laughs) Again, with the memories of my old man. I'll be back right after I open up a bottle of Captain Morgan to remember him. Stackers, I'm daddy's best bartender, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. 
According to History 101, on October 24, 1926, Houdini, then 52, did a show with a 104-degree fever collapsing as soon as the curtains closed. He died a week later. By the end of his career, he was famous for escaping straitjackets, boxes, and even being buried alive. But what restraining device did Houdini start his career with? Handcuffs. Speaking of my dad. And now, to help you teach your family to get free from the shackles of a work schedule, Doug Nordman and Carol Pittman. Doug and Carol, how are you two? Well, I'm a parent, so I'm a little tired. Not going to lie. <laughs> Hi, Joe. It's good to talk to you again. Uh, I, I really enjoy having a, a Doug on the show. We need more Dougs in podcasting. So thank you for having Doug around. Yes, absolutely. More Dougs, the better. Although I feel like everybody calls you Nord. So you've have you disowned your Doug? Is that the deal? Oh, yeah, I respond to either name. The Nords was the family-friendly version that my first XO gave me on my first submarine. So that one's just kind of stuck with me over the years. And and as a further derivative, mine was Nordy. So we have Nords and then we have Nordy. That's right. Oh, nice. We got like levels of the Nord here, right? Well, let's start off, Doug, with you. You're a money nerd through and through, which I know, and your daughter knows, but our listeners don't know. You actually, I, I think this is like the height of nerdery, which is, you know, we could have a picture of, of you, Doug, on a mantle somewhere. Because, <laughs> Thank you. Because, <laughs> w- w- well, did you really keep track of how much money it took you and Marge to raise Carol? Well, what are you saying? Are you saying that not everybody does that? <laughs> of course we did. We wanted to know. We were running Quicken. Uh, we had just installed Quicken uh, a couple of months before uh, Marge delivered Carol. And so it was a lot of fun to track all the expenses. And of course we tracked her $166,000, about two thirds of what the uh, USDA at the time said that cost to raise the average child. So when you're able to raise a kid for easily one third off, you want to talk about that and let people know it's not as scary as it looks. <laughs> Carol, do you feel like you were on the end of the discount bin being one third off? Sadly, there is no warranty, no refunds, no reimbursements. <laughs> right. Yes. And I've, I've heard that's in general for parenting, but, but no, there's, there, there was no feeling that I was missing out on anything or that there is something that I was being told you can't afford or you can't have. Frankly, I didn't really notice anything until we got to the, the flashy years, the middle school, the high school years. And that was because I was paying for most of my own stuff at that point. But my friends were still getting, you know, all the designer clothes and designer bags and designer shoes because somebody else was paying for it Mm. for them. But me, I didn't want to pay that kind of designer money. I didn't have that kind of designer money. Well, you had to make choices with your money. Yeah. Well, I definitely want to get back to that because that is about your choice, not a parent's choice that you decided that wasn't worth worth your money. But I want to go back to this idea of to $200,000, $250,000 to raise a kid. And while... Doug, you know, you and I are laughing about the fact that that's a third off average. I think there's still a lot of people surprised by that number. Having a child is very expensive. I think it's expensive at the hospital if you don't have the insurance coverage. But once you bring the child home, I I don't know if it's like this for every family, but uh, many hand-me-downs have gone through our house to Carol and many, many more hand-me-downs. I mean, the world today seems awash in used baby clothing has uh, gone through their house. And so right off the bat, you're never probably going to need to buy the designer stuff for the first two or three years for a kid. So, I mean, go ahead and have fun if you want to buy something that's uh, very special to the child or very special to the family. But that's more entertainment than it is uh, health and sanitation and handing clothes down among family members or shopping at thrift stores and garage sales. We, we have always enjoyed that type of lifestyle. We've always been frugal and it's always been a fun challenge. Uh, And we continued that with her. I will say, though, that the grocery bills for a teenager, that that's a lot. That's actually where the real money budgeting starts happening is when you're trying to keep up with their calorie consumption. Meanwhile, I have a I have a toddler at home. Right. And so my grocery budget is really easy right now. I have to buy Greek yogurt, hot dogs and peanut butter. And that's about it. (laughs) (laughs) And up till Carol started kindergarten, child care was a very big expense, especially because Marge and I were both dual military active duty at the time. And so the likelihood was that we drop off early and pick up late. And so the uh, child care expense is a very big issue when you're starting a family. I would say it may be from zero to five. That's probably the, the, by far the biggest expense uh, followed closely by diapers. 
And, and then after that, food is fairly straightforward. I mean, they do eat a lot for such a small, tiny human, but it's affordable early on. And then of course, by the time they're the size of an adult as a teenager, that expense starts ramping up. We did deal during the early school years with all the expenses of buying what we needed for the school supplies. And that got very expensive as a teenager. I think, Carol, you remember the graphing calculator that you had to have for math classes, but, but that turned into a teachable moment and it wasn't as expensive as we had originally feared. Once you buy one used and use it for the school year and then sell it to the next kid in line behind you in the school system, then you essentially rented a calculator for a year for about 20, 25 bucks. But if you go out and pay full retail, yes, it is very expensive. And I think child care is, is probably the biggest expense. And in, in my case, in my, my spouse's case, uh, I don't think either one of us were ready to do the, the child care by ourselves. You know, you need to have some respite care. You need to have some kind of a hui, a neighborhood group to share child care among people. And uh, there's a lot of things that are learned at a child care center that a kid would need to learn at that age. And if nothing else, their immune system becomes very much stronger from living with all the other kids <laughs> at the child care center and bringing that home for the family. But also just the basic social skills and learning how to play with others. That's something that's easily done at a child care center. And it's a very big expense, but I think there's a very big payoff at the end. I want to ask you about the genesis of this project in general, because I think, Doug, uh, this all started at a Camp Fi, which for people that, you know, we've mentioned Camp Fi a few times here, but not not a ton. So Camp Fi is this camp that happens all around the United States made by this wonderful guy named Stephen Boyer. And uh, he sets up these weekends that initially, Doug, to me, sounded absolutely horrible. You go, you go, you go <laughs> to this. <laughs> yeah, well, well, no, 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 not that part. It's the fact that I'm a little too bougie for sleeping on a razor thin mattress. Like there was a day where sleeping on a little razor thin mattress with Doc G as my, uh, you know, over earn and invest was my uh, roommate. I have a roommate that's not my spouse. Okay, now, and now it's hardship. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Now it's absolutely horrible. And by the way, we're going to sit around and talk about money. Ah, but by the end of the weekend, as you guys know, it's wonderful. But this all started at one of those camps, I believe. Tell me that story, Doug. Well, I'd been going to FinCon for three or four years by this point. And when Camp FI and Camp Mustache came along, I started attending those. And as I got to probably my third or fourth Camp FI, I think it was 2016, I would start to talk about financial independence and high savings rate and 4% safe withdrawal rate and everything we know, which seems common knowledge today, back in the 80s and 90s, this was blazing, bleeding, cutting edge. And I get the audience reaction of, yeah, yeah, we get it. We understand math. We know how to do that. Tell us how we teach our kids. And I'd say for the first two Camp FIs where I got that question, I pretty much babbled something that we had done. I, uh, we gave Carol an allowance, yeah, uh, but I really didn't have an answer ready for that subject. And even more disappointing from, from my perspective about my performance was that I did suggest to one of the Camp FI attendees that they try to give their kids an allowance and let them make some choices with small amounts of money and see how that worked out. And we met again a few months later, different Camp FI, and they said, ah, you know, I, I, I gave the kids the money, but they, they lit it on fire and ran around the backyard like it was a 4th of July sparkler and they had all kinds of bad choices with it. And I really didn't feel like it was going well. I felt like we were wasting the money, so I stopped doing it. And so now I was not only not giving good advice, but I was actively delivering what people interpreted as bad advice. And so I figured I had to get this straightened out and understand what I was dealing with. And then one day we were visiting Carol and her spouse and we had that dinner table conversation about Camp FI. We'd already finished talking about spreadsheets. Of course. We started talking about Camp FI and I said, Carol, I got that question again about raising uh, smart kids with money and I, uh, I didn't really have a very good answer. What do you remember? And she'd been apparently holding on to some of these thoughts for quite a few years and she had a lot I on her mind. I remember a lot. <laughs> yes. And at about three or four minutes into it, I was really enjoying what I was hearing from her, but about three or four minutes into it, my spouse looked at me and made that little motion with her hands that means you better start writing this down. And uh, at the end of the dinner table conversation, we'd already thought about writing a book. And after that, uh, I, I don't speak for everyone in the audience, but I will say that doing a project like this with one of your progeny, one of your children, adult children, is a wonderful experience and a fantastic way to get to know them as an adult and bonding and 
a whole lot of other secrets came out during the editing that perhaps <laughs> I've never really had the uh, right opportunity to discuss before. That was very educational for me as well. <laughs> Yeah, the fact that you two are still speaking is good. I've, I finally read all the books on the shelf, by the way. During COVID, <laughs> in between nap times and sleep deprivation, I finally read all the books on the shelf. That was one of the revelations, Joe, is that uh, all the books that I was leaving out for her to read, all the books that I put in her bedroom, all the books that I left artfully scattered around the house that would give her financial literacy in, in about an hour, she read none of them. That's one of the major lessons that today I deliver to families is you got a book, great, they don't care. Go to YouTube, go to ebooks, go to audiobooks, do anything but dead trees on paper. Well, and you make this point, Carol, in the book too, which is, you know, parents can do everything they want, but ultimately it's going to be the child's choice whether they dive in or not. Exactly. And and as a parent, I'm seeing that from both perspectives now. I remember being the kid and my parents telling me to do something and I'm thinking, ha ha, no, that's not happening. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole different perspective when you're staring down your toddler and you're watching her in her head because she can't quite say it yet is going, ha ha, no. And you're just like, okay, well, this is not going to work. Um, I'm going to have to be more of a ninja parent about this. I'm going to have to figure out how to sneak this in somehow. And, and the reality was that it was more about repetition than it was about giving the order and expecting it to be followed. You know, it was, <laughs> yeah. it was letting the kid telling them, Hey, I think you should do this. And then you're telling the kid not to fall down the stairs and then they fall down the stairs and they realize, okay, I should not do that. I should do what mom and dad said, not because they're right, but because this hurts. Well, and it's funny that you say that because you also make the point, Carol, in the book that, um, you can try to stop your children from making financial mistakes but it actually is them making mistakes that's the important thing. It's about letting them fail. It's a little better to start failing with small amounts of money, right, Carol? Right. And, and I remember being in a, in a social situation where I was convinced to buy a placemat. And, and of all the things a fourth, a fourth grader will buy, the last thing you expect a fourth grader to buy is a placemat. But it was a social situation. I was trying to get along with some people that I had gone out with. You know, I was trying to be the cool kid, trying to go along with the, hey, there's four of us here. There's a four placemats in this one set. You should buy one with us. And, and I came home, and I think I spent the rest of the evening complaining to my parents about how I got fooled into buying a placemat. <laughs> a placemat costs like, what, 10 bucks? Not even in, in today's world? And so making that mistake in fourth grade with 10 bucks is way different than making that mistake with a coach or a Prada purse in high school because you want to be the cool person in the classroom. And, and the reality is, whether it was a, a placemat or a purse, now that I'm, oh my gosh, it must be 15 years out of high school, I actually don't even remember what the other kids were wearing anymore. Well, and, well, and you guys also dispute this idea of having kids save for the future at the at, at the beginning. Like when they first start getting money, you, neither of you seem like big fans of, hey, let's take all this money and save it. And, and absolutely not. There's no interest in doing that. What kids want to learn how to do is they want to learn how to manage the money and use the money and make choices with the money. And th this is where the real power is, is being able to choose to eat pizza or buy ice cream or get that cool toy at the store. And, and you have to use the money. If you tell them to put it away somewhere and save it for 15 years and if they're really good, they can spend it at college. Well, who wants to go to school? And it makes no sense. So to a kid, if a parent tries to confiscate their money for saving, to a kid, the only way to avoid having the authorities taking away all your money from you on your birthday is for you to spend it as fast as you can and just get it out there and make very fast choices <clears throat> because you're racing ahead of the parents who are going to take all your money away. And so instead, the idea is to give them the money experience it, talk about the potential, talk about the opportunities, talk about the choices, and then let them go out there and make those choices. And I can guarantee you they will mostly be bad choices. <laughs> and that's where the real learning happens. You, you experience the emotions, the buyer's remorse, the toy that breaks, the toy that doesn't live up to the commercials, the toys that all the other kids stop playing with, the things you spent your money on didn't have the things that you felt you would get from them, so forth, and, and just goes on and on and on. And one day, as a, as a five-year-old or a six-year-old, you hit rock bottom, and now you're ready to develop some ability to save for a goal, or maybe you're willing at least to make better choices. 
I felt this analogy, Doug, and you guys didn't present it this way. So this is all Joe right here. We had Annie Duke on talking about poker and she's talking about just minimizing your losses, right? And maximizing when the pot's big, maximizing your wins. And I felt like as I was reading this, while the pot's small, while Carol's making $10 decisions or Carol, when, when your child's making you know, $2 decisions in the next few years, let them screw up with $2 and $10 so that when the pot's big later, they've already been through this, the emotions of $2 and $10. Well, we're talking, as a young adult, we're talking student loans and 401ks. We're talking real money now, not just $1,000 in high school or $100 in elementary school or $10 at the dollar store as a five-year-old. You told uh, Doc G, Carol, my friend, Doc, to our friend, Doc G, about uh, growing up with your dad, something about (laughs) where some story about like every other parents headed to work and you're, you're passing by, you're on your way to school or something and passing your dad like with a surfboard. Oh, yeah. So the the school bus stop for both the middle school and the high school, it's on the one road that you need to get out of the neighborhood. So every single parent is going to be passing by that bus stop on their way to work in the morning. And so everyone will do the, you know, the aloha wave, the shaka, you know, hey, have a good day at school. And most of these parents are, you know, they're they're wearing their aloha vest because they're going to work. Well, unlike all the other parents, here comes my dad to the intersection and he's he's not, you know, expeditiously making it to the stop sign and then taking that left to go back up the hill. No, he's creeping and crawling across the bus stop until he <laughs> makes it to that bus stop. And then you see the entire 1993 Ford Taurus in its in its aqua glory <laughs> with multiple longboards strapped across the top. Now we we just saw the banker and the Mercedes Benz go by five minutes ago, whizzing as fast as he could. No, no. Now we got this old Ford Taurus that's inching up to the line with the surfboards on top. And dad's saying, Have a good day at school. I'll be at the beach. And I and I'm just like, I gotta get a good job. I got to get a good job. That way I'm not that dude that's stuck in the Mercedes going to work as fast as he possibly can. I want to go to the beach. Yeah. Yeah. What a great lesson at the beginning. And I want to take that and go to something, Carol, that that you really outline, like uh, teaching kids about money. You've got the, the journalistic approach, right? Who, what, when, where, why, how. Can we walk through those briefly? There is this need to try to find the exact moment and the exact place and set up the right situation. I mean, it's the it's the basis of every sitcom we've ever seen, right? You're, you're trying to manipulate the situation so that you as the parent have the perfect moment to throw in the lesson and say, and this is how you do it. And that never happens with kids. I mean, again, you have no control over anything. It seems like everything that they do. But what you can do is you can kind of look at the situations you already have to do and see if there's a way that you can include your kid in the situation. Uh, A big classic is you're probably hauling your kids to the store with you. Pick your store. You know, if it's the grocery store, if it's Target, I'm, I'm one of those people. If it's anything that you love to go and shop at, well, bring your kids along with you. And then give them your credit card at the beginning of the store. Just, just let them hold the credit card while you're walking around the store. And that's all they have to do is make sure the credit card is still there when you get to the end of the store. Otherwise, they can't buy anything. But then they get to swipe the credit card or they get to tap the credit card or hand it to the cashier. You know, just just let them have a little bit of inclusion there. And when when you have that credit card in hand, you would be amazed with the questions that your kid will come up with. What do these numbers mean? Is Mommy, is that your name right there? What does this date mean over there? How can we get a silver card? I want a red card. How do I get a red card? You know, all, all these little different things that, that you can just talk about. And it's the idea there is not that you're hitting a certain benchmark or meeting a certain standard or anything else that we've heard about in the public school system. The point is that you're just taking the stuff you would ordinarily do and having a conversation about it, which inevitably is going to wind up talking in some way, shape, or form about the very topic you're here for, which is money. That's fabulous. I uh, I remember when I got tired of, as another money guy, another money nerd, I got tired of my kids just always asking for stuff at the grocery store. So I would give them the list and then we would hunt. It would take longer, but they were great moments, especially when we got to the item and we learned to talk about, uh, uh, now this is when they're a little older, maybe fifth grade, sixth grade unit cost, you know? So my kids would then look at the unit cost of things and would find out that sometimes the bigger pack is the better deal because you're buying in bulk and other times it's not, right? And there's just these ahas. And 
the amazing thing about this was the only reason I did it was not the noble mission you guys are on to teach kids about money. I just didn't want to bitch in anymore. <laughs> I didn't want them asking me for stuff. It was actually easier to educate them than it was to take this constant grind of dad. Can I have, can I have, can I have you like, Oh man. And it is that game of fetch, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's that whole game of fetch. I'm doing it with my own two and a half year old. It's like, I don't want to go and get something for you. I want you to go get it. You know, can you go get my shoes for me? Can you go get the groceries for me? Can you go do this? And, and that's naturally how it progressed, right? At first it was, you want the kids to go over to the next aisle and go get that stuff ahead of you. What you don't realize is that in a subliminal plane, you're actually training them to be your delivery driver when they get their own car. <laughs> so now the the new incentive is they get to go drive to the grocery store by themselves. Mom and dad isn't watching them. They get to play whatever they want on the radio on the way there. Like, it is their ride. And then if you give them a delivery at the end of that, a delivery fee, the same way that you would pay the the Shipt or the Uber Eats or the Grubhub or, or however you would pay for delivery, well, you pay your teenagers that instead. That's fabulous. This sounds really stupid, but the whole idea wasn't that we were giving Carol all these wonderful pieces of advice about money. Instead, we would try to figure out the financial incentives. And the idea for this came out of our Navy careers, where if you signed up for more sea duty, you got paid a little more money. Uh, if you agreed to sign a contract to stay on active duty for three or four or five years, you'd get a little bit more money. And we said, geez, maybe this will work on a seven-year-old. So, Carol, if you <laughs> if you make a healthy lunch at home and take it to school instead of buying school lunch, we'll let you keep half the money. Or if you clip coupons for things we normally buy at the grocery store, we'll let you keep half the savings. And if you ride your bicycle to school instead of taking the school bus and buying the school bus ticket, we'll let you keep half the money. You can see the trend here. And uh, a kid that gets that financial incentive at first will test it out to make sure it really works. And as long as the financial system at the family house holds up and follows through on those commitments, it's a very powerful incentive. And they will look for opportunities to make more money because they understand now that when they put out effort, it gets rewarded, just like your employer gives you a bonus. I want to ask you, Doug, about digging more on that because you make a statement early in the book that as Carol is growing up, you're, you're sharing, you and Marge are sharing everything about your money. Like as she asked, you just, it feels like nothing is off limits. Was there anything off limits with Carol that, that she'd ask about that you'd say no? Cause I was much more like the average family in America where my brother, right. or sister, I would walk in the room and if, if they're having a financial conversation, my parents, we were told to leave. That's how I grew up. And that's where my financial literacy was all the way up into my early twenties. And you've heard of the talk about revenge parenting, where you raise your kids better than you were raised. That was one of the things we tried to do. But it was also a factor, again, of our military career, because all of our pay in the military is listed on a website for everybody in the country to look up anytime they want. If you know what somebody does in the military, you can go to this website and look up their pay, look up their special pay, figure out all their benefits, and you can come up pretty closely approximating how much money they earn. And I was shocked about all the conversations in civilian corporate America where we don't talk about our pay. We don't talk about our bonuses. We don't talk about any of that stuff because there would be... We don't talk about Bruno. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there'd, be, there'd be pitchforks and torches in the streets and there'd be rioting. And I, it never occurred to us. So as we were raising Carol, we would reassure her. One of the things that happens when you're financially independent, you stop working, is your child becomes aware that you're not earning any money from a job like the other families. And they start to worry, who's paying the electric bill? Where are my groceries coming from? Are we poor? Do we have to move? So we would reassure her. We have this much money in the budget for electricity. We have this money in the budget for going to the beach. We have this much money in the budget for surfboard wax. And we have enough money to do the things that we need to do and, and some of the things we want to do. And so here's how it works. And we would go over the budget. And I remember, Carol, there was one day you looked over my shoulder. I was working on our net worth statement or something like that. And and you said, holy shnikes, dad, is that, we're rich. Yeah. But uh, that was a teachable moment, right? And the whole discussion was, well, this money has to last for the rest of our lives. And it looks like a lot of money. And, and maybe it is, but I'm only 40 something years old. And this money is going to have to last for another 60 or 75 years. And here's how we would do that. And at this point, Joe, you can talk for a while and suddenly you notice their eyeballs start to glaze over. So you know that the message has been delivered and you can move on to some other subject <laughs> or not. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> or, or maybe not. Carol, uh, uh, your dad mentioned revenge parenting. Is there anything that your parents did <laughs> th that you would Good do question. differently that you would do differently? 
I, I wish I could take credit for this, but really I need to blame COVID for this. Um, I remember as a kid having to deal with the tag team parenting and a, a lot of families will say it's not our fault and they're right. When you have a full-time job that demands your time, not just during business hours, but thanks to cell phones and the internet, now it's in evenings and weekends as well. It's really tough when you're a kid that has no idea what work is that you have to explain to the kid, no, you can't do this right now. Mommy needs to finish this phone conversation. Mommy needs to send this email. Mommy needs to go and make sure that this is taken care of. And 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 it's that it's that give and take that we're already dealing with as Americans as adults mm. about when it is you put down the cell phone and you log out of the work email and when when you have to leave. Well, when COVID happened, uh, my daughter was born exactly two months before COVID lockdowns started in our home state. And so the day she got vaccinated with the ordinary two-month-old vaccination schedule was the day that they said, and we're shutting down until further notice due to COVID. And so for the next 18 months, she got more of mom and dad than she ever wanted in the first place. Because <laughs> we, were, we were at home. We, we, we weren't going anywhere except for the neighborhood park. We would go to the grocery store and... Depending on the day, I would have her strapped to my chest because she's still a baby at the time. I would have her strapped to my chest as we're going around the grocery store. So I'm pulling things off the shelf and she's doing the baby thing of drooling and looking around. I mean, we had so much quality time together that by the time she was 18 <laughs> months old, we started daycare not because we parents needed it, but because she was sick and tired of us. She would start <laughs> doing the things that made it obvious. It's like, I don't want to be here anymore. Just get me away from you, folks. I'll come back for the meal. But until then, just just get me out of here. <laughs> Doug, one last question for you. What the heck is a kid 401k spreadsheet? The kid 401k it teaches a kid to save for a goal that's a lifetime away. It's a lot like a 401k. And the whole idea is that at eight years old, you put together <clears throat> a spreadsheet where you show how by the time the kid is 16 years old, if they invest their mandatory contribution into the kid 401k, along with generous parental matching and an awesome stock market. I think I had to have the stock market work at like 15% per year every year for eight years. If you do those things in a spreadsheet, by the time they're 16 years old, they will have money to go buy any car they can afford. And you notice I didn't put a number on that. I just said any car that you can afford. Let the fantasizing begin. And so as an eight-year-old, that's the ultimate power is being able to drive the car wherever you want, whenever you want. And it totally de-stresses the whole idea of, hey, what car am I going to get when I'm 16, Dad? Hey, Mom, what am I going to get when I'm 16? Instead, they have a chance to look at the spreadsheet. You you give them monthly reports. The stock market performance has been stellar. The The thing is working on track. Everything's going great. And then you also take that opportunity to have a conversation about, well, when you are 16 years old, what kind of car are you going to get? Did you notice the prices at the gas station if, if you're driving a gasoline car? Did you know that you have to pay money to insure a car? And so you talk about all those things. And eventually, by the time they're 11, 12 years old, this has become internalized. And they learn that they can make their own choices for their own car with their own budget, with what is their own money. So the kid 401k, I mean, when you're an eight-year-old and you've got to wait eight years, that is literally a lifetime. But it's the biggest deferred gratification program we had ever thought of, that we had ever come up with. And it worked great, I think. Right, Carol? And so here's the twist that mom and dad didn't see coming. You know, the nice thing about finances in general is that you can use quantifiable and qualifiable values. So they didn't give me a number. They didn't give me a quantity. They just said any card you can afford. That was a quality. And and you as a parent didn't have to try to figure out, you know, inflation rates and how much cars are going to cost these days and what happens when we have another chip shortage and what happens if we have another COVID and inflation and then and, 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 and. that that's too much. By by making it qualifiable, then I have to figure out all that stuff. And I have to use my kid brain to figure that out. And so at around age 14, we're in the car, we're going somewhere. I'm sitting in the back seat. Mom and dad are sitting in the front seat. And we're sitting in the very same Ford Taurus that had been the surfboard hauler for all these years. And and mom and dad say something like, and we're not sure if we need to buy a new car. And I knew already at age 14 that they were not referring to the current year model. They were referring to a used car that was a decade younger than the yeah. Taurus we were driving new in right to me. now. New to me. New to us. Yeah, yes. right. <laughs> yes. Well, this just happened to be, let's see, I was 14 years old. It was 2006. And the Toyota Prius had the hybrid model that was out, and it was this massive amount of gasoline efficiency. I know 2006 was only 16 years ago, but for everybody that just said, holy crap, that was 16 years ago, welcome. 
<laughs> when, when you have this Prius that has all this gas efficiency, well, I've been sitting in the back seat with dad pointing out the gas station saying, hey, you're going to have to pay, because this is Hawaii, $3 a gallon when you start <laughs> driving. You're going to have to figure out how to come up with $3 for every single gallon of, and I'm doing the math in my head of, you know, I live in the middle of the island, so to get to the beach, I'm going to have to pay this many gallons, which is this many dollars. I need a more fuel efficient car. So the 14 year old me in the back seat looks at my parents and says, well, I have $5,000 in my kid 401k. If you guys want to buy a new to you Prius that's only a couple of years old, I'll put in my share. I'll give you all $5,000 if you let me be the primary driver on the car. And for the first time I remember in my childhood, there was silence in the front seat. <laughs> And, and and they had that moment that I now recognize as the as the spouse look. They kind of just look at each other like, you you go first. No, I'm not going to go first. You go first. And and so I think someone finally spoke up and said, "That's a good idea. We'll think about it." And so when they thought about it, they actually came back with what was essentially a lease contract. They basically said, "Well, we understand that you're going to give us five thousand dollars, and we'll accept. But here's some of the terms. First, you're going to be the one in charge of taking care of the car. So you're going to have to make sure that the oil changes are, are taken care of. You're going to have to make sure that there's there's tires, you know, there's air in the tires. You're going to have to make sure that you're locking it appropriately. Do the car washes if you want. We don't care. Make sure you're taking care of the car. Any damage you do to the car, we're going to take out of your $5,000 deposit. And so that right there was incentive to tell my friends to not bang their door against everybody else's door in the parking lot and to not sit on my car and make a nice dent in certain aspects or to kick my car or to do this or do it. It was it was mine. I, I it was my money. And it was a very visible thing day to day that you will respect my car. And then I was born late in the year. I actually have a Halloween birthday. And so I knew I was only going to have the car for about a year and a half, you know, from the day I turned 16 until I go to college a year and a half later. And so part of the deal was, when you go off to college, we'll give you back your deposit minus damages. And then you can use that money however you see fit going forward into college. And so I went into college with $4,800. Minor fender bender. <laughs> Sweet. I went into college with $4,800. And a couple of years into college, it just so happened there wasn't enough housing on campus. So I move off campus. And now I need a car. And so I'm 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 doing the whole used car shopping thing that I just watched my parents do for most of my childhood, you know, that I go on what was now Craigslist and I started looking for used cars. I do the whole negotiation process. I'm looking up consumer reports to make sure that the model that I'm interested in and the year that I'm interested in won't have uh, transmission issues or engine issues or brake fluid issues or pick a recall and there's probably something out there. But I'm I'm actually spending the ten dollar a month subscription to make sure I have that information ahead of buying what wound up being a $4,200 1999 Honda CRV, And I purchased the 1999 in the year 2012. And, and that car only had to make it four years, but it literally made it all the way out to my duty station in Spain with the Navy and back to the United States. Fabulous. That car was a hacker. I was impressed. It was wonderful. But but this was that was that was the culmination of my financial education as a teenager. I had learned that I could spend all my money on a Mercedes and it would be, literally this happened once, it could be wrecked by somebody else in the parking lot. Or, or I could have a cheaper car that I gave utmost respect to and got my friends to respect and I would still have money left over to pay for the gas, to make the oil changes, have somebody else do the oil changes now. All these little factors that we've been talking about for the last Oh, 18, 19, 20. I mean, the conversation never ends. All those years, we're, we're, finally coming, we're finally coming to fruition. The book is called Raising a Money Savvy Family. It is fabulous. And by the way, it's not just these uh, quirky, amazing, fantastic stories about not just money lessons, but, but a family that talks about money. You guys go over when's the right time to start teaching kids about money. You, you talk about allowances. You talk about, um, well, just all the stages of teaching kids and, and getting them into, into saving, but I think in a way that's actually going to stick. Uh, books available where, guys? In the library. Everywhere. <laughs> nice. <Yes. laughs> nice job. Good, good work. And, uh, spoken like a frugal dad there, Carol. Where else is it available? <laughs> <laughs> so if your local library does not have it because the hours don't work out to your schedule, been there, okay. done that, I know then they do offer it everywhere that you buy books. So you can find it on Amazon. I find Amazon to be my favorite just because Kindle editions are cheaper than print editions, and it's just wonderful that way. 
um, but you can find it Amazon. I'm pretty sure we, we've heard a lot of folks saying that they bought our book as a means to support their local bookstore and their local small businesses. That's also another opportunity that you have. I love the physical version of the book, by the way, because this is a book I would mark up. Well, I would totally mark up this book. So unfortunately, I can't get it from the library. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I'm not saying you should deface public property like that, but it certainly has happened. Yeah. I'll also point out that the audiobook from Audible, the audiobook is what's turned out to be most popular because you're in the car, you're working out, or your kids aren't going to bother with an ebook or a paper copy. But if they're listening to it in the car with mom and dad, which is already not cool, then at least they're willing to have a conversation about money. It's fabulous. Carol, Doug, uh, thanks to both of you, by the way, for your service to the country. We really appreciate that so much. And thanks for helping stackers uh, raise financially savvy family. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks for the support, Joe. And uh, we really enjoy doing this conversation. Hey, this is Joe Crane, host of Veteran on the Move podcast. And when I'm not helping veterans transition to entrepreneurship, I'm stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Doug and Carol. Oh, gee, I like this idea that kids learn about money through financial irresponsibility, not financial responsibility. But if you trust them with little amounts of money, you let them mess it up. Yeah. And circle back a little bit later and do some parenting. They will get all the mis- We're all going to make mistakes. And why not get them out of the way when they're young? I, I thought you were going to say they observe. <laughs> they learn through observation. <laughs> of. But, but I was thinking about this the other day, like how many people I know that are in the financial space who did not learn finances at home, like who, who were on the other side of it. This was so messed up in my house. I have to do I have to do the job that ensures at least I know what to do. I may not do the right thing, but at least I'll know how to do the right thing. What if there's a study somewhere of financial advisors who were who were money mess ups? Money mess ups as you know, family were. I think you gotta let your kids make mistakes on the little things so that they don't make mistakes on the real big giant things. And money is one of those big giant things that they can muck up pretty quickly if they don't know how to do it. Lots of good lessons there. Let's throw out David Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life, uh, Doug, Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. At the moment, it's finding some solution to keep the woodpeckers off the side of my house. I mean, I've got one of those owls up there. They just, they don't care. Those are, those birds, they just fly around with a giant finger up. Their middle finger is up all the time. They're they're amazing. And usually I only have this problem in the spring. It's, I mean, I've got woodpeckers like you wouldn't believe in the spring. But this is the first year I've had them in the fall. So we're walking around the house, pounding on the walls, trying to scare them off the side of our house. So that's what I'm valuing. At the beginning of that yeah. story, I thought... Uh getting the woodpeckers to stop banging on your house was a euphemism. I'm like, I don't even know what that means. But Usually it, sounds, it is. But it sounds like a horrible condition. It just sounds, <laughs> sounds I don't even bad. have pills for that. I, wow. Uh, it is your loved ones in your time, and it doesn't say no woodpeckers, which I guess they assume that. Uh, of course, that's why they may buy quality term life insurance. Actually simple. You go to stackybedjamins.com slash havenlife now to get your free quo. I love what they're doing at Haven Life because they're committed to offering a modern way to buy life insurance. Their application is simple. It's online. You get an instant coverage decision, affordable prices, and of course, all their policies issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual, more than a 160-year-old insurer. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to Biff right after you pause it and go to stackybedjamins.com slash Haven Life and get your insurance in place. Let's get your life insurance together, people. Wouldn't that be great? Get it done here before the year ends. Here we go. Biff, say hello. Hey, Joe, OG, and Don, Dan, or whatever that third guy's name is, which isn't important. Biff Smith in Virginia Beach here, longtime caller, first-time listener. I've got some money in the Vanguard bond funds, and, of course, they're all in the red. I don't need the money, may never need it. But I'm wondering what you would advise someone to do with that. Do you sell it now, take the losses, and get into the market, try to recover those losses? Or do you just ride it out if you don't need the money and hopefully enter the black in a few years and then sell it at that point? Or do you just go to cash and then let inflation eat all your money? I mean, what do you do here in that kind of a situation? I was wondering what y'all's point of view would be, what you would advise a client to do. I appreciate everything you do. I appreciate the show and all your other work, and have a great day. 
Biff, thank you for the call. And I'm wondering if uh, I met you when we were down in uh, Virginia Beach for our the book event. We had it at the beautiful library downtown there. Just an amazing, amazing place that we had that event. But I'm thinking, Biff, is there a casino down there close by? Maybe if he took it out and took it to the casino, maybe a horse track. Is that what you're about to say, OG? DraftKings. That's 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 the ticket. You don't even have to leave your house, Biff. No, you just do it on your phone now. You can Apple pay them money and you get the six way parlay for the Monday night game. It's all done. Money bags. A week it. or two, you won't have to worry about that money anymore. Yeah. You only have to be right. What is it, like 10, 10 NFL bets in a row and then that's you're it. a gazillionaire? Cha. Start with a hundred bucks. <sighs> Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Done. Just get them all Thanks right. Thanks for the call, Biff. If you've got a question for Good us. Good luck. Head, head to stackybenjamins.com slash voicemail. All right. Uh, Biff's worried about those bond funds, OG, and doesn't need the money. What do you, what say you? I mean, there's so many things to say here. If you don't need the money, why is it in a bond fund? I mean, bonds are pretty much the devil anyway, so I don't know why you'd have those, period. But I think you got to start kind of just kind of reframe the whole thing into what is the purpose of this money? Because that's going to tell you where to kind of head with it the reason that you're having anxiety around the the results of the performance of it is because it's not aligned with the thing that you need the money to do. You've got your money invested in a place that is designed specifically for very short-term results and also has gotten hammered because of interest rate increases, but is generally for that kind of one to five year time horizon. And yet you don't need the money if ever, which means that it's an unlimited time horizon or at least something greater than five years. So you need to start with what's this money for? And if it's for a long-term investment or long-term time horizon, then you better be finding long-term investments. And uh, uh, that might look a lot like stock funds. If you need the money short-term, it's going to be cash or something that looks a lot like cash and guaranteed outcomes. So That, I think, solves that, like, where do I put it? The question then, of course, is, well, what do I do now that I had a 10,000 bucks and now I've got freaking 8,000 bucks? Like, what do I do now because I'm down two grand? And the answer is, you don't get to cry over the spilled milk. (laughs) Like, that that ship has sailed. You can't wait for it to recover. You have to figure out where is the best place for it now based on the goals that I have now. And as long as those two things match up, the results will come in the, in the manner in which they're supposed to. I would advocate if this is long-term money, it needs to be in a long-term investment, like ownership of the great companies in the United States and the world. And now, not when the market recovers, not when somehow it signals to you that the that it's on the way back up again, just move it tonight and be done with it. Yeah, I think a lot of people get wrapped up in this particular investment and the fact that this investment's in the red and they want to see this investment get back in the black, made money before they they make a move. And if you're moving upstream, OG, where the waters are more volatile, meaning it's going to go down more, but it's also going to go up quicker, you definitely, if you've got this long-term time horizon like Biff does, why wouldn't you swim over to a spot where those rapids are going to move a little faster? You know, especially after some of the downturn we had this year. I'm not saying it's going to come up right away, but heck, if he doesn't need the money for 20 years, I mean, why wouldn't I move there right now? So he doesn't even have to play that game. 100%. Yeah. I mean, you're thinking of it, where's the best place for for this money today? I mean, imagine it's hard to take out that context of I had 10 and now it's worth eight. But if you think of it in the context of I have eight, take out the... The, the preamble, you know, just go, I have 8,000. Where's the best place for this money over the time horizon in which I need it next? And if that time horizon is 10 years or 15 years or unlimited, then the best place is in the ownership of companies of the United States. So in the world, so get it and know it, that, that ownership by nightfall, move on with life. Think about something else. Thanks for that question, Biff. If you've got a question, great question. Uh, thank you so much. If you've got a question like Biff did, stackybenjamins.com slash voicemail. And uh, we're sending Biff a Haven Life Greatest Money Show on Earth shirt for being brave and uh, asking that question. So thanks a ton for that. That's going to do it for today. Man, we got a lot going on here in the basement, OG, that uh, we want to end with. Some community notes here. Number one is on Wednesdays, 
you'll find uh, me, sometimes Doug, usually a fintech creator, chatting about, well, whatever headlines are happening this week that doesn't make it to the show and diving into some of the cool stuff on your phone. Join us Wednesdays. That's Instagram Live, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific, uh, every Wednesday that we're in the basement. And that includes this Wednesday. So come join us here in a couple of days. Speaking of Wednesdays, this Wednesday, a retirement calculator that we love. People ask us all the time, hey, what uh, retirement calculators, if I want to dive into these, do you really like? We like a calculator called the New Retirement Calculator. And we're going to have Nate from their team who's going to dive into five mistakes people make when using retirement calculators. And he'll also show off the new retirement calculator. So if you're looking for calculators, that's going to be next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, uh, Wednesday, October 26th. You'll also find details. If you're signed up for the 201, you'll get uh, details. Of course, if you want deep dives on anything we talked about today, Social Security, Raising Money Savvy Kids, uh, uh, what to do in markets like this. Brooke Miller on our team does a great job of curating deep dives for all those stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. And last but not least, of course, if you're not here for any of that, you are concerned about the market, chatter around recession. You hear that eight point, you hear that monster number for Social Security and realize that's because inflation's through the roof. Well, OG and his team have put together a free guide that shares eight moves to make in a down market. And this guide will help you plan more and panic less no matter what the market does. So head over to stackybedjamins.com slash guide. That's stackybedjamins.com slash guide. And you'll get this helpful free guide from OG. That, I think, is all of our community announcements. Uh, Doug, you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? First, I just want to say I, I did not participate at all in that Haven Lifeline discussion because I was protesting uh, the caller who was clearly trying to get under my skin. I mean, it was just in such an obvious ploy to get me to go into rage mode. So I just muted my mic and raged off mic. Just want that to be known. Okay, so Joe, here's what we should have learned today. First, take some advice from Doug Nordman and Carol Pittner. Prioritize your time with your family, or, you know, at least the ocean. Second, when your investing account is in the red, is not the time to sell. It's the time to buy. But the big lesson? I wish my dad were here to see how I grew up. I mean, I could still pick a lock like Houdini. He'd be so proud. Thanks to Doug Nordman and Carol Pittner for joining us today. Find out more about them at militaryfinancialindependence.com and find their new book, Raising Your Money Savvy Family for Next Generation Financial Independence, at your library or wherever books are sold. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2022, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from Joe, me, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen to our show, check out the 201 Deep Dives written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. Both she and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at The Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor.
Doug, I think it's time we start talking about the platform for uh, your bid for president. Oh, gee, I think we have something very serious that we need on uh, Doug's platform as his campaign advisors. I went to our local grocery store called Albertsons. I don't know if you guys have heard of Albertsons. It's not going to be called Albertsons for long. Really? They're changing the yeah. name? Kroger's putting Kroger. their bid for them. Oh, I Kroger did not. Kroger has 2,800 stores. Albertsons has 2,200 stores. And their Kroger's is trying to buy them and put a serious dent in Walmart's massive chunk of the market. Well, what I love about Albertson is that it is deliciously average <laughs> and, 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 and not assuming and not that great. Uh, but not horrible. Like it's just functional. Right. But the one thing we suck less <laughs> that, that, that should be Albertson's phrase. Uh, the one thing that I find very frustrating is that on an end cap, some will call them jerk. Put these things, Oreo booze, which are three different designs for Oreos. Uh, on an end cap. Now, people that know me know that I have this MetPro diet coach, Jesse. And I don't know if you would know this, but uh, Oreo spooky uh, booze are not on the list of recommended MetPro eating things. I'm out. Somehow, somehow these ended up in my cart. I have no idea how. And then I end up over in the in the milk aisle. And then there's milk in my cart somehow. I don't know. I blacked out. I have, I have no recollection how this all happened. By the time I got home yesterday, there's, you know, three rows of cookies in here. By the time I got home, somebody had shoved one of the full rows into my mouth. That's just a serving size. If it's a, yes. And by the way, by the time, Doug, you and I were playing this uh, Xbox game last night after I got home from, from yeah. poker night. There's two left in the entire, in the entire. Yeah. Well, entire you bin. had a little bit of wine at game night and uh, I felt like I, you got, gave me that call. I'm like, I got to talk him home. I got to make sure he gets home safe. And I heard the crunching and the crinkling and all of that as you were driving. I didn't know what when it somebody was. Somebody calls you at 11 at night. You're, you figuring, okay, you know, something, something's going on and, and, right. And, uh, you know, I, I gotta, I gotta order an Uber for my buddy or something. No, not Joe, 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 you're like, put the, put the Oreos down. He's like, I can't, I just, <laughs> you're going to hate yourself in the morning, Joe. They're, they're so good. They're so good. Like, you know, <laughs> when we call Doug, it's like, put the bottle down when it's Joe, it's put the Oreos down. I get, I get, I get pulled over and they're like, uh, so DUI, no, uh, 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 D D U S D U S driving under sugar, driving under sugar. Yeah. D O S driving over sugar. Sir, you're swerving all over the lane. Yeah. I was trying to reach the milk that's over there. It keeps on sloshing. Is that an open container? (laughs) But they're basically enablers. I mean, Nabisco is basically an enabler because they made the, to open the package so much easier now at the top that you just peel off instead of having to slide the package out and then slide it back in. I mean, whose idea was that? That person needs to be fired. If you get arrested, I think you go to court and you bring them in as a witness because they're asking you to eat those things while you're driving. Well, they did me no favors because now I got to, I got to figure out the story for Jesse (laughs) (laughs) about how this whole thing ended up in my in my mouth in one day, in one stinking day. I can't do it. I, I, I eat a lot. I mean, I can't, I can't overstate that. I eat a lot, uh, but I can't do sugar. I can't do b- big quantities of sugar. I get this, like when I do that, my, I get this weird bitter taste in my mouth and it just doesn't work for me. And I can do four Oreos and I love them. But if I have a fifth Oreo, it's like uh, everything changes. And so uh, I've never been that guy that eats like whole rows of yeah. Oreos at once or like I can't do. Um, no, I'm the same cakes. I'm the same. I'm just not a quitter. <laughs> You're just not a quitter. <laughs> it, it tastes like crap after five, but I keep going. <laughs> Ma didn't race no quitter. <laughs>